Welcome to the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios of the National Press Foundation in Washington, D.C. My name is Rachel Jones, and I'm the Director of Journalism Initiatives for NPF. We're here today for our eighth Widening the Pipeline virtual training. But before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Bayer, the Evelyn Y. Davis Foundation, Lenovo, Johnson & Johnson, and Twitter. For this eighth Widening the Pipeline virtual training, we'll be focusing on the power of our voices. Too often, people of color are either sidelined or left completely out when it comes to big advances in technology and research and other similar realms. But people like our first speaker today, Devar Ardalan, are determined to push for representation for technology and innovation. Devar is National Geographic's executive editor for audio, and she joins us today to share some exciting information about her work in the field of artificial intelligence and storytelling. Devar, welcome to Widening the Pipeline. Thank you so much, Rachel. It's a thrill to be here with all of you. Before we jump into your terrific presentation, I'd like to ask you to give us some background on your own journalism career and how you got started. Absolutely. Um, I started at member station KUNM in Albuquerque, New Mexico as a work study reporter when I was in college, uh, getting my journalism degree in Albuquerque. And uh, fortuitously there, I saw a message that came through from Washington at NPR where they were looking for multicultural producers to support, to come to Washington for a symposium. And I applied and my mentor, who I'll briefly talk about later, uh, found me in the midst of all of these applications. Uh, I was a single mother at the time in New Mexico, just getting my journalism degree. And I asked if I could be considered. Uh, lo and behold, he picked me and you know he's uh, supported my career in the last 30 years, if I may say so, um, to where I am now at National Geographic. But at NPR, I was responsible for uh, morning edition, specifically putting on the live show. Uh, I was responsible for all weekend programming at NPR News. Uh, I wrote Scott Simon's evaluations and helped get the late Daniel Shore on Twitter. So a very varied background. Um, I came to National uh, Geographic uh, two and a half years ago as a head of audio and uh, looking forward to sharing more about the work that I did in the last five years in the space of voice and artificial intelligence. Um, some of this work was done previous to when I was at uh, Nat Geo. And I, yeah, looking forward to sharing more. Well, this is a tremendous opportunity for me because as we talked about earlier, though I had worked with you uh, remotely, I never got to meet you in person. So this has been quite a treat for me. So why don't we let you Take it over right now with your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, absolutely. So yes, I'll be doing uh, a brief introduction, a little bit more about my journalism background and uh, digging into some of the case studies that I've done around voice and artificial intelligence. The image that you see to the left is my great, great ancestor, Masture Ardalan, who was a Kurdish historian um, many women throughout history, of course, their voices remain hidden, um, and not many people even know that there was an amazing Kurdish women historian. So I like to honor uh, by having her image. Uh, and to begin with, this is my mentor, Doug Mitchell. Last night, we uh, were in Washington, D.C. together, uh, meeting up and connecting uh, Doug Mitchell is head of Next Generation Radio, and literally in 1993, uh, he picked out my application from amongst many. And just to say that mentorship matters, and uh, his presence in my career and in my personal journey has meant everything to me, and I wanted to make sure I thank him. Um, so this is the National Geographic audio team, and uh, we come from many different backgrounds, and uh, in terms of innovation, um, uh, Carla Wills, who is our manager of audio, uh, returned very recently from Benin, Africa, where she's leading a spatial audio uh, podcast companion for 
a story we're doing on um, the Clotilda and the descendants of Clotilda going back to Africa. This is a companion series with National Geographic Television. Uh, also here you'll see Brian Gutierrez uh, on our podcast team, um, Jacob Pinter on our podcast team, all of them working on spatial audio content, Eli Chen, our senior editor, uh, Kyrie Douglas, uh, another producer. So I uh, love that we come from many different backgrounds and are working in the space of bringing audio to new uh, frontiers uh, through National Geographic work. Um, myself, I'm a mother of four together with my husband. Uh, we've raised seven boys and a girl. And so being a mother is very important to me. In early in my career, it made a decision in terms of whether I wanted to be a reporter or a producer. As a producer, I've been able to balance a little bit more. And so being a mother is very important to me. Uh, as a producer, you get to a little bit have your own schedule as opposed to when you're a reporter and you're assigned to stories from around the world. Um, so very much a big family and we're very close. My husband, John Smith and I, um, this is a big part of our life. Uh, I also had the opportunity to be deputy director at the White House uh, Presidential Innovation Fellowship Program. This was a one year um, opportunity where we were in the federal government and we helped bring people from private sector into the government. We worked on this AI project on uh, health and innovation, which was really amazing. And I'm happy later to share that. I just give you some background to share that I've had experience within the federal government, within journalism and the private sector when it comes to the area of AI. Um, so in uh, 2019 is really when we started looking at the space of voice and artificial intelligence. So as you all know, uh, Alexa, you can ask Alexa to tell you about the weather. You can ask Siri to order food for you. But to me, you can also ask them to tell you your stories. And in 2009, we were selected to be in Geneva at the AI for Good Summit, where we presented Sina, the storyteller. Sina was a voice AI through Google Assistant. And uh, Sina was able to tell you stories from women around the world. Um, we feed this data to Sina. So there's a database. And you're able to, um, similar to how you would write, you know, short headlines or captions to a photograph, we would be able to write short captions and feed these uh, to the uh, AI system, in this case, um, the Google uh, Assistant program, and uh, literally be able to sit on a living room couch and be able to ask uh, Google to wake up Sina the Storyteller. So incredible way to experiment with this new space of uh, AI to be able to see how we can actually put our own stories into it. I'm gonna play you um, a two minute clip of an example. We worked with three Native American technologists and uh, shared stories from Native American traditions. Do you have a story from Cherokee tradition? Do you know about the three sisters? corn, beans, and squash. Traditionally called Shailu, Tuya, and Kayashekwa, they are planted very intentionally to promote sustainable soil fertility. Shailu is first. She allows Tuya to climb toward the sun, Une La Noon He, while Kayashekwa's giant leaves protect the dirt from drying out and allow the three sisters to flourish together. What else would you like to learn about today? Tell me a Cherokee recipe. There is a delicious Cherokee recipe from Mrs. Clifford Hornbuckle for fried corn and beans. It's traditionally called She Lu Ashu Yi Tu Yu. To make it, you cook corn with beans and pumpkin until they're soft, then add beaten walnuts, hickory nuts, and molasses for sweetness. I bet it's delicious. What else would you like to learn about today? Sina, are you a chatbot? Yes, you can call me a chatbot. I think of myself as a digital storyteller and curator of global cultures. For now, I am a demo with limited abilities, but my creators are working very hard 
to give me the power to learn and teach people about traditions and cultures from all over the world. So I was uh, very honored to be uh, invited to go to the um, ACES Summit. Uh, this is the um, Native American Engineering Summit. And there I presented this work uh, together with the Native Americans who we collaborated with. And in the room uh, was a Navajo elder. I had the courage to ask him and his son, who's 25 years old, would you rather learn about the heritage of water uh, you know, in our lives and history through your dad telling it to you for 45 minutes or a chatbot telling you in two minutes? And the son who was 25 laughed and he's like, I would like the chatbot to tell me that in two minutes. And the father laughed. And it really was an, a very amazing example of how we can honor our elders, our traditions, our cultures, and help our um, elders also to understand the power of technology. In um, October of 2020, in the height of the COVID pandemic, my beloved mom lost her life um, to a rare blood disorder and she passed away. It was very difficult for our family and I to be with her, even though for the last two weeks of her passing, we were all together. My mother, Lale Bakhtiar, was a formidable Islamic scholar. And she was the first American woman to translate the Quran into English. It was a gender neutral translation of the Quran. And she had uh, been written about in the New York Times and really uh, in the scholarly world of Islam and Sufism, she's a formidable voice. She also was the historian of our family. She had over 5,000 letters from our family. She had written over a hundred books. She had so many other works in uh, progress. Before she passed, I was working with her to bring her work to conversational AI because I really felt that a new generation of American Muslims should be able to understand from a progressive woman about the tradition of Islam and to be able to learn. And so uh, I created this conversational AI after my mom passed and together with my siblings, we put together a database of all of her work. So what you hear in this voice AI is actually the words of my mom, either written to us to an email or written in, inside of some of her documents. So this is another way to share and preserve knowledge. Hey Google, talk to Lale Knowledge Lake. Salam Alaikum, what can I help you with? Tell me a story from your childhood. I spend all my free time either reading or praying. Among my favorite books were Louisa May Alcott's Little Women, where the absence of a father figure reminded me so much of my home growing up. Oh yes, I also loved Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre. These strong women heroines would fill my mind with dreams and visions. I have so many more stories to share with you about my mother Helen and father Abul Ghassim Bakhtiar. I can share my website for more if you like. Tell me more about your research. Certainly, Quranic psychology is the science of the self. Our self consists of body, soul, and spirit. So as we search for the meaning of life, we often ask, what are you? From where have you come? Where will you go? Why were you created? These are questions of profound interest to us now and in the past to those who went before us. What do you think about artificial intelligence? Like a living oral teaching, AI can be used for handing down traditional knowledge. My children are working hard to add some of my writings and books on Islamic psychology and Sufism into this tool. I think that AI is a good way to learn about ancient traditions that can bring more meaning to your lives. Try asking something else. Tell me about your grandchildren. They are the most beautiful and loving humans you'll know. Their names are Saeed, Samira, Rod, Ryan, Aman, Amir, Ryan, and Layla. They are entrepreneurs and actors. They are culinary experts in traditional medicine. They are students, technologists, and digital policymakers. Do you want to see some of our family stories on my website? 
Yes. I have sent you my website via email. Try asking something else. Thank you, Lale. So, um, the Lale Knowledge Lake is on Google Assistant. And again, it is a demo because clearly uh, this is a new medium. And uh, we are trying to be able to show that it can be used as a resource, foundational resource for um, sharing knowledge. So uh, one thing that I wanted to ask for your patience is I'm going to go back to a slide because I, it was really important for me to share this information. So uh, this is the slide. I think that conversational AI is important because it allows us to ground ourselves in heritage, community, and accessibility. Conversational AI can be a resource for anyone who is seeking to understand global cultures. You can be talking to Alexa, again, instead of the weather, you can ask them to tell you about a Hispanic heritage culture that is happening in that particular week or day or month, or any other cultural reference that you think is important. It's uh, also important because you can add culturally rich data to it, that it can curate into compelling and interactive voice experiences. Next is the idea of community because personal narratives and private digital records can be accessed by a new and wider audience, similar to that of my mom. Um, also the new generation of guardianship can become engaged with their community, history and culture, similar to the example I shared of the Native American community. And then around uh, accessibility, obviously voice is an excellent medium to address issues uh, uh, with the elderly who are alone, uh, but also with the visually impaired. And voice also solves distance issues during COVID. Many of us were isolated from one another. And here's a remarkable way to be able to share uh, our uh, stories and cultures with each other and with our younger generation as they grow up. So in the um, fall of 2022, uh, as you all know, uh, women started to rise throughout the streets of Iran. These demonstrations were uh, incredibly um, surprising to many around the world because some of them were young teenage girls who had come out in the streets to talk about their, their wanting their voice to be heard. And so together with um, several different women in the space of voice and artificial intelligence, uh, we came together and we invited poets and writers to come to an event in Washington DC on November 12th to read poetry from Iranian women. And so we went back in history and we found that there were hundreds of Iranian women who had have written phenomenal poetry or amazing stories about women's rights. And we started to create this new voice AI, uh, which is called Freedom Speaks. And Freedom Speaks is a project that hopefully will uh, come to fruition um, in February or, or March of this year. And these are the women behind Freedom Speaks. Azinwa Amadi is in Nigeria. I've been working with her this morning this is the power of women in the voice and artificial intelligence space. We're all over the world. We talk to each other on Slack. We're creating this tool called Freedom Speaks, again, virtually together. Welcome to TBD, a storyteller dedicated to the courage. I call it TBD because at the time we weren't sure what Alexa would approve in terms of the name. We wanted the name of this assistant to be Zan, but Alexa said that Zan is not a US word and we could not use Zan. So Alexa, the certification process rejected us calling this Zan. We had to go back to the drawing table and think of another name and we thought of Freedom Speaks. That's why you hear me saying TBD on the demo. Just voices of Iranian women, past and present. Women have always been at the forefront of progress in Iran, even through centuries of turmoil and conquest. 
With TBD, you can experience some of their voices. So what would you like to hear? You can say stories, poems, music, or more about TBD. Poems. Sure. We have a collection of five poems, each under three minutes. This is minutes. some of the back end. To navigate here. through the poems, you can say repeat, previous, next, or main Where menu. you're helping train the AI begin. to understand different the first poem is by Alam Taj. Names of Persian women. My name is Azar Nafisi, and I'm going to recite for you a poem by Alam Taj. He was born in uh, 1883 and uh, died in 1947. Uh, she was a housewife who uh, hid her poems uh, um, in her books of poetry in Rumi and Saadi and Hafiz. And uh, her poems were discovered by her son after her death. Uh, she's a fierce uh, defender of women's rights. Bound with fetters of freedom, I am head to toe. I am a slave, my friend. Freedom, my master. Next poem. My the second poem is about Simi Bey Bahani, also known as the Lioness of Iran. This is Jackie Leiden. I'm reciting a poem that Samin Bey Bahani wrote about turmoil in Iran. I interviewed her there in 1995. Later, in 2009, she published this poem, Stop Throwing My Country to the Wind. If the flames of anger rise any higher in this land, your name on your tombstone will be covered with dirt. You have become a babbling loudmouth. Your insolent ranting, something to joke about. What this space of voice AI allows is to lift barriers. We can be gatekeepers ourselves when it comes to creating these stories, the fact that it can be distributed on your smart device and instantly, okay, after like six months of developing it, instantly it's in people's living rooms, millions and millions of people's living rooms. That's the power of voice AI. That's the power of bringing our lens to it as people of color, as communities of color, as journalists, as writers, as storytellers. We have to claim the space because it's not used for this right now, right? Right now, you still want to get your stories published in the main, main newspapers. But what if you actually could directly have people in your community accessing these stories? Um, it also allows for um, us to work on the lack of adequate inclusion of Persian or Farsi uh, languages and voice. Right now, Alexa obviously doesn't allow for the Persian language because of many different reasons. Um, so we want to be able to inform Alexa and Alexa's database and background and AI as to uh, the Persian and Farsi language. So the benefits of working in this space, media subjects, it can be open to many different media subjects that you want to address and tackle. Source data, you're adding source data to these big voice AIs like Alexa, which is unheard of and currently lacking. And third is the idea that you can bring diverse teams together from around the world to build these products. Thank you so much. And I'm excited to stop sharing and answer your questions. I have absolutely have chills from seeing that presentation. I think when you and I talked the first time, Devar, the there are two things that struck me, and that was the absolute profound opportunity for you to connect with your mother after her passing uh, using this technology, but also the possible use of this technology to connect movements around the world, particularly women's movements. And when you, you think about what happened in Egypt, you think about what's happening now in Iran. Uh, so when tell us a little bit about that aspect of this as well. Yeah, uh, well, um, in terms of the Iranian women, uh, I'm in touch with Mahnaz Afghami. Mahnaz Afghami uh, was the first 
uh, women cabinet minister in Iran before the revolution. Uh, since then, for the past 44 years, she has uh, been a fierce defender of uh, women's rights uh, through her uh, organization's Women's Learning Partnership. And when she saw this technology, Rachel, she said exactly what she said. You said <clears throat> the possibilities of this, of bringing women around the world around issues and topics that are important for us to discuss and build consensus around. That's one thing, right? The other is individually for communities who feel unseen, unheard, hidden. There is an opportunity to bring your own glorious creativity to this space. And also, it doesn't mean that it has to be viral. It doesn't have to be viral. It just has to be something that you are proud of, that represents your culture, your work, the stories that you feel are not being told, that communities need to hear. And I remember um, I, throughout my career, have had opportunities to travel around the world. I was in Tonga. And I was there for a story on uh, emerging storytelling tools and using um, virtual reality to be able to help, hey, help um, kids in the South Pacific to learn about their heritage. Why? Because obesity is so high, because they have lost and the knowledge of hunting and their traditions of fishing and their traditions of eating healthy food from the land. And so how was it that we could, through virtual reality, experiences, introduce them to their ancestors. And we did that. And this was a project with the um, Australian aid program. This 13 year old child from Tonga said to his father, why is it dad that every time I search Google for Tonga, the only thing I see is that we're obese, we're fat. Just think about that. Incredible. Um, I see one question here. I'm going to ask those of you, I, for some reason, my screen is freezing. So if you've dropped questions into the chat, uh, please raise your Zoom hand. But I do see the one from Amanda Goki. Uh, Amanda, are you there? Can you? Why don't you speak with uh, Devar? Yeah, for sure. Thanks so much for your presentation, Devar. My name is Amanda Goki. I'm a reporter in New Hampshire, kind of between jobs now, but I'm going to be working for The Globe starting at the end of the month. <laughs> Your example about <clears throat> Native American communities was particularly interesting to me. I'm Ojibwe, and I was just wondering sort of how you've grappled with the balance between sort of culturally sensitive materials. In my tradition, for example, there's certain stories that are only meant to be told in wintertime, for example. Um, so I'm just curious kind of how you've grappled with that, how you think about it. Um, when you're kind of balancing that with ease of access? Okay, yeah, perfect question. Uh, I only work with teams uh, from the cultural um, communities that I report on. So the three Native American technologists, they volunteered and gave those stories to us. The Cherokee story from Three Sisters came from Tracy Monteith, uh, who used to work for Microsoft. And uh, he was also, um, the first Native American to put the Cherokee language into Microsoft Word when he was working at Microsoft. Tracy volunteered that story because he knew that the three sisters story was a story that he was comfortable sharing. Uh, with Chamisa sharing a recipe from the Navajo uh, and Dene, her tradition, it was a recipe that she felt comfortable sharing. So it's really important that as we create these tools that we bring um, our newsroom that creates this has representation from the community that we're um, speaking about or telling the stories of, if that makes sense. Daisy, you had a question about customization. Uh, why don't you ask Devar? Yeah, so I was listening to what you shared um, when your mother was talking about her childhood and I just had the thought that I really would have preferred to hear it in her voice. Um, Similarly to how you did the, the other piece with the, the Freedom Speaks, I really enjoyed that one because I was able to hear the poems um, and the explanations in the voice of those women. I think that for me and for a lot of other people, probably, um, one part of AI that turns me off is that robotic voice. 
um, it doesn't really, it's not something that I really want to listen to or that I feel happy engaging with. Um, I would prefer to hear another human voice. In the case of the um, Iranian women, like I like to hear what their voice sounds like. Um, and especially when we're talking about people um, coming from different cultures, I think it's really wonderful to be able to hear their voice. Um, so are there, you know, ideas of maybe changing that part of AI to make the sound less robotic? Yeah, well, um, in terms of the uh, AI industry, they've made incredible progress when it comes to, um, you know, making voice AI sound more, forget, forgive me, human generated. But I, I agree with you that um, uh, you guys should be recording your elders right now so that when you create your voice AI, it's their voice. My, my beloved mom passed away. I didn't have the opportunity to do that. I do have a file. She actually recorded her voice via GarageBand, and I have that file. And so I'm very happy that I have my mom speaking. And in future iterations, the videos we have of her recordings, we will be able to isolate her voice. But just to give you a sense, when you're creating these experiences, you can definitely use the human voice. So similar to how you were going to create an audio story, you just have a clip. And then that's the clip that you put into, for example, the AWS uh, data bucket that then is able to play it on Alexa. So there there are opportunities and the technology allows you to be able to play audio from the human voice. Uh, and in terms of automation, that is going in the direction that perhaps, you know, in the next few years that that they do sound more human and interesting. Navarra, I want to talk for a minute about the tech and innovation spaces that you have to operate in when you're, you're pushing for these uh, innovations. How does it feel to be a woman, woman of color? Uh, I don't know if it's in the venture capital phase or the, the fundraising, however, uh, whatever iterations that, uh, tell us about your experience in those realms. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that because I think that uh, communities like the one that you have at the National Press Foundation around widening the pipeline and bringing a group, groups of like-minded uh, future journalists together, you need that when you go into this world because it's very unforgiving. Um, first of all, I'm a storyteller. I've been a journalist. I got my journalism degree. So number one issue or barrier was that they never took me seriously because I didn't have a degree from Stanford. I wasn't a coder, even though I was informing the space in a very dynamic way. So that's the number one thing that I had against me, even though I had all this experience because I wasn't a coder, uh, they looked down on me and, um, you know, dismissed a lot of this until, for example, I was written up in, you know, journals and my work started appearing in scientific journals. Um, the New York Times featured me last March for the work I've done with Native Americans, which I'm happy to share. So you have to have um, a lot of thick skin and you have to be, you know, uh, it's really important to stick to your convictions. But Rachel, the other thing is that um, there's no reason you can't start thinking about this as a project within your own newsroom because you are very powerful right now. People need people from diverse backgrounds in newsrooms because <clears throat> audiences want to reach they want people to tell them stories through authentic voices and people who come from different communities. And so you have the opportunity to go and talk about this. I'll give you one quick example. Um, we, um, for example, at National Geographic are doing some amazing work uh, on indigenous um, conservation around you know, stories from everything from how you tackle wildfires to how you make sure that your water is safe and clean. And uh, there's an opportunity to do oral stories around these. And again, in the context of making sure that the communities are comfortable and giving permission, 
imagine, you know, a future opportunity where even with uh, National Geographic or Disney, there's a conversational AI that is capturing these oral histories. And you can access them again through a future portal. It doesn't have to be Alexa. It could be a portal that your own newsroom creates. So think about that because I think that you need to build this and have a group of like-minded people around you to support you that come from business, that come from tech, that come from journalism. If you want to do it alone, it's it's very difficult. And that was my challenge. Um, I had a great team, but again, I was a founder that wasn't technical. And uh, I by the way, self-taught myself everything I know. And I'm doing all of this. I am the Amazon Alexa developer. You're looking at her now. That is so exciting. I see a Zoom hand. Laura. Yes. Hi, Devar. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. I especially loved um, right from the get-go where you recognize your ancestor. I think that's really cool. And now I want to like dig through my own genealogy. So thank you for that. Um, so I work uh, for the Pointer Institute under a branch called MediaWise. And so what I, I help kind of run a newsroom across the country made up of teenagers who fact check claims online. And a lot of what we are doing right now has a lot to do with like AI misinformation and stuff like that. And I guess I'm just wondering, um, because I have, I have so many feelings around AI, like part of it is so exciting. Um, and like, I'm <clears throat> just to see like, what you're able to do with it. And, and, you know, like all the opportunities that are so endless is so exciting, but I also feel very scared, um, partly because I'm just scared of robots <laughs> and um, all the robot movies growing up freaked me out. But also like, I do wonder about like, say to Daisy's point about like recording your people and getting them up on there and stuff like that. And I just wonder if there's anything that's being done now, or if you see anything happening in the future where like, ne'er-do-wells who can take advantage of like your actual voice that's been recorded or um you know just any type of situation like that where they can like create misinformation um you know even and and like not to like overthink too much but you know say like if my intention was to create dis mis and disinformation I could like go and say like lie about my culture and you know go on this whole thing and then that's like what would be spitting out I don't know I guess like my question <laughs> it's it's less of a question maybe more of an idea but I guess just I want to know your thoughts on maybe even like 10 years from now like what this kind of setup looks like and you know what what we can do now to kind of prevent misinformers and stuff like that yeah, amazing question. Uh, so when we first started this initiative around cultural AI and voice, uh, we presented this work at Morgan State University in Baltimore, and we brought together AI specialists from around the world, literally, who flew in to Baltimore, as well as storytellers. And the first thing that we talked about was creating a declaration of human, machine, and culture? And what are the ethical uh, frameworks that you need to consider when you want to uh, come around this you know, idea of bringing culture to AI? So I can, I'll can i be happy to share that with you because uh, we've done several white papers on it. To the short answer is that, uh, for example, if you wanted to do more of this at Pointer, uh, you are working within the framework of an ethical a company where you can actually bring together, uh, you know, AI uh, and storytellers and create this declaration, which really grounds you similar to how NPR, Rachel and my NPR was born, whatever, 50 years ago, there was a mission statement. You cannot, for example, you know, go within outside of the boundaries of that. So I think that you have to, um, rise to the occasion. You can't be scared of these tools, but you also have to help inform them. And the, you inform them by making sure that your newsroom or your organization has ethical guidelines that are not just for humans, but for machines as well. Thank you. Yeah. It's one of those things where it's, it's like, and I feel, and I don't know if it just like comes with, you know, as you get older and stuff like that, but there's like part of me that's like resistant 
to the yeah. feeling. And there's like the other part of me that is understands and very much accepts that like the world is changing and like, it's not our job to hold it back, but it is our job to like, kind of try to rein things in. Yeah, and exactly. Being done correctly. It's all so spooky. <laughs> or I get it. Uh, I'm scared of robots as well. well <laughs> But anyway, Gabby, I see your Zoom hand. Hi, Devar. Uh, my name is Gabrielle. I'm a reporter for PolitiFact. So we are the fact checkers who <laughs> may have to do this. Um, so Laura's question kind of gave me a, oh God, <laughs> type of uh, feeling. But uh, to follow up mm. with that, I know you mentioned ethical uses for, um, for this type of AI, but what types of tools could... Uh, journalists like me use for fact checking? Um, what kind of tools would be helpful for us when we do have to deal with this um, down the line in terms of people who use AI for misinformation? Um, what are the tools that we should look for to assist in, in making sure that accurate information gets out there? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, in terms of deep AI, um, a lot of work that continues to be done in the last a couple of years to sort of um, de, you know, to take the junk out, right? To 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 just use a very easy way to imagine it. Um, but I think that um, we're not there yet. So this idea of general AI that you would be able to, as a fact checker, go in and say, "I'm just making this up," like make a note. Oh, by the way, this is wrong. There there isn't a tool like that. That's accessible to everybody in the public. So I think it's more um, organizations and startups are creating software where you can at least make sure that your content, the content that you're searching isn't biased. So there are definitely tools for that, which um, you could easily research. So that these are like de-biasing software, but it's a very early stage of this, um, this area. I think what I'm suggesting is that more than uh, going to this field of generative AI and wanting to make sure the facts are accurate, I'm suggesting we need to still spend years feeding it our information. So to give you an example, MIT had something called the Story Understanding System. That MIT story understanding system was very important in early days of AI, where AI would in, be able to like talk to you in a way that was conversational. That MIT Genesis understanding system was fed Shakespeare and Alice in Wonderland. It was, it was fed Western literature in order for it to become interesting, communicative, even be able to talk to you a little bit like a human, okay? Victor Yarlett, who is one of the Native Americans I work with, he, for his master's thesis program at MIT, proved that the Genesis understanding system can learn a culture other than Western Europe. He fed a hundred pieces of Crow Native American content to this system, poems from his Crow tribe, traditional knowledge, and he was able to prove that MIT's genocide understanding system was much more diverse because of him. So we're not yet at that point where we can say, oh, you know, uh, I checked, for example, on Kurdish heritage and, you know, the stuff that came up was very general. Well, of course, because I haven't fed Masume Erdogan to it, the, the female historian's book because she wrote that in 1818 or something. And guess what? I need to get translated in English and I need to put it into AI because if somebody tries to do more searches for Kurdish heritage, they need to know her vantage point. She wrote about Kurdish history. So I think I'm just saying that it's early days and now is when we have to feed our cultural information and resources to this big AI field. And uh, they're, different ways to do that. I'm just trying to do it through this little narrow tool of voice AI. Devar, this is such an important aspect of this conversation because of the issue of cultural erasure. Uh, yeah. so in so many forms, you hear people say that uh, as long as the information is being transmitted, it, it shouldn't matter. 
it, whether what the voice sounds like or whether it's a machine or whatever, as long as you're getting the basic information about up uh, across. And so I'm I'm so thrilled to to hear about your endeavor and other endeavors to ensure that uh, cultural aspects are included. I think I saw uh, Amanda, your hand raised. Hi, yeah. <clears throat> You've been sort of touching on this and um I feel like this question just builds on kind of what we've already been talking about. Um, I feel like in our generation, there is a fair amount of skepticism around, at least I experience it, you know, the promise of social media, right? Like we're going to migrate this part of our lives online and have greater connectivity through it. I wonder like how you think about that and just sort of the philosophy behind um, what you're doing, the motivation, if you could speak a little bit to that sort of vision that you have for it. Um, I guess just coming up in an era where there's, is this promise of like, you know, parts of your life are going to go online that previously have maybe been in person and that will lead to greater connectivity. And obviously, you know, I think we're all living through this difficult moment, realizing just the, some of the shortcomings there. So I'd be really curious to hear, hear more about how you think about the vision where you see this leading. Um, I believe that, um, this is the opportunity in this uh, beginning now and for the next 10 years to inform this space. And it needs to be done together um, with people from different voices to be able to, again, uh, think of frameworks and which part of this particular, you know, big industry do you want to be able to inform? Uh, just remember that many people from mainstream backgrounds are already doing this, okay? So the MIT Genesis Understanding System has Shakespeare in it and Alice in Wonderland in it. What does that mean? That means from now until eternity, whatever eternity is for AI, it already knows Shakespeare, it knows Alice in Wonderland, it knows all of these cultural references. So if we don't come together in a way that is um, responsible, but is also very, uh, you know, um, it's gonna be risk averse, but is from a place of goodwill, uh, we won't, we'll miss this boat again. We'll miss this boat too. So we'll wake up 10 years from now and we'll say, you know, oh, look, uh, they just looked at, I'm making this up, Facebook data for voice AI and all of it is racist. Well, yeah, because, we had an opportunity to come in and do something about it proactively ourselves. And we decided that we were so disenchanted by social media and we were so disenchanted by all of the mistakes that the mainstream Mark Zuckerbergs have made. We were so disenchanted by all the ways that we were, our cultures were not lifted that we will just simply say, I don't wanna be a part of this. Okay but the industry is moving forward and we will be left behind once again. So that's it. We could keep you here for another <laughs> hour, but I'm going to, to wrap this up by asking you about mentoring. Um, I know Doug, I know Doug's amazing reputation in this industry. And I'd like, and it's clear that his, his support of you and his uh, working with you is, has just been incredible. So I'd like you to offer some closing advice to the journalists about uh, leveraging and, and uh, using that connection or to sort of fuel your vision and your, your career. What advice would you give? I think that foundationally, you want to hopefully have mentors who have like the long view, okay? Who've had a career that you look at that you're proud of, that not only have they been representative of communities of color and making sure they give them seats at the table, but they also were good parents, but they, they also were good husbands or wives. They also had a balance in terms of their life. So Doug, like he also has a life. I love him because he also loves his family. You know, I've grown up knowing 
about his daughter and kid, son and their successes. I think mentors can't just be so like type A that it's all just about, did you make it to the New York Times? Where is your next article going to be? You know, but encourage you to be a whole person. I feel that Doug in any way, and maybe he doesn't even know this, in any way at that vulnerable moment when I was a single mother in 1993, and I had no idea how I would ever get out of Albuquerque, New Mexico and make it to NPR News. It was because he read my story and he saw some promise because I said, I'm a single mother. I have won all of these Associated Press Awards in Albuquerque. I'm ready to have a job at NPR, you know? And then he brought me there. And obviously it was a lot of also my own hard work. But throughout the years, he's always been very encouraged to save your energy, save your energy, take time off. Those, I guess that's what I would say, is find a mentor that's going to help you be well, well-rounded in your career and in your uh, personal life. Devar Ardalan, you are now um, enlisted to, <laughs> into the family of widening the pipeline because we want to keep track of your progress of the project with all, uh, progress of all the projects you're working on. But thank you for being a powerful, powerful voice and role model in journalism. And we, we will have you back, hopefully at our, our session in March. We have a, a closing workshop in March. So I'd love to have you come back and talk with our journalists then. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was an honor to join you. Thanks, Rachel. I have one last thing to say, Devar. Um, my name is Heba Ahmed. I'm, I'm a producer at NPR. And um, I also, this is a different part of my life, but I admire and have studied your mother's work. Um, I have a master's in Islamic studies. And so I've centered Islam and gender in a lot of my work as a student. And so to talk with you today and to hear, it's to, just to say that your mom's legacy carries forward and to see how you're carrying it forward is just like, one of the most beautiful things and to see this intersection. So this is such an honor. And then to hear her voice was like, I have like a copy of the of the Sublime Quran and it's like written up. So like, wow, what a what an honor. Thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge and your advice today and just everything. So you make your mother so proud. So yeah. oh Heba, what a beautiful, beautiful way to I was going to ask you about that, but I see the emotions and what it's sparking in you, but it's just beautiful. Thank you so much for doing that, Heba, and thank you, Debar. Thank you.